Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum dear viewers. Welcome to this session of Quran for Ramadan. Today we will be reading two verses from Surah Al-Anam. Uh, I'm going to now read out the text in translation. Kul ta'alaw atlu ma harrama rabbukum alaykum alla tushriku bihi shay'an wa bil walidayni ihsana wa la taqtulu awladakum min imlaq nahnu narzukukum wa iyyahum wa la taqrabu al-fawahisha ma zahara minha wa ma batan ولا تقتل النفس التي حرم الله إلا بالحق ذلكم وصاكم به لعلكم تعقلون ولا تقربوا مال اليتيم إلا بالتي هي أحسن حتى يبلغ أشدة وأوف الكيل والميزان بالكست tell them come I shall tell you what your Lord has forbidden to you do not associate anything with him treat your parents with kindness never be unkind to them and kill not your children for fear of poverty. We provide you also and shall provide them too. And do not even go near vulgarities, whether they are open or hidden. And do not kill without justification any soul forbidden by God. These are the things God directs you to so that you use your intellect. And that do not go near the wealth of an orphan except in the way that is better for him until he reaches maturity and weigh with honesty and full measure. لَا نُكَلِّفُ نَفْسًا إِلَّا وُسْعَهَا وَإِذَا قُلْتُمْ فَعْدِلُوا وَلَوْ كَانَ ذَا قُرْبَ وَبِأَهْدِ اللَّهِ أَوْفُوا ذَلِكُمْ وَصَّاكُمْ بِهِ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَذَكَّرُونَ We do not burden a soul with more than it can bear. And when you speak, speak the truth, even if the matter is about your relatives. And fulfill God's promise. These are the things God directs you to so that you receive a reminder. So viewers, as you can see, this uh, once again is a list uh, which is presented in the Quran and you would now have become familiar with the fact that this is a very common feature in the Quran that as far as basic morality is concerned, it keeps reminding human beings of that morality that is innately found in them. So the Quran does not uh, remind us something about something which we do not already know about. As far as basic morality is concerned, ethical behavior is concerned, conduct is concerned, the thesis of the Quran is that these are things that we already know from inside, our nature, our intuition. These are all very well aware of what right and wrong are and how we should be conducting ourselves in life. So when the Quran mentions such a list, as you can see is the case at many instances, the purpose is not to, for the first time, present a list of prohibited or items which are allowed but rather to remind people of what they already know, what they already know from inside, something which God has already blessed them with. So the thesis of religion and the Quran is that mankind has not been sent in this world without any guidance. Innately, they know what good and evil are. That is why these good and evil, uh, the way they are addressed, they are called as universal human values. These are universal human ethics as well. Everyone sticks to them. Whether they believe in God or not, even then, they are people who adhere to them and they like them and they uh, abhor things which are forbidden in them. So the Quran, when it presents this list, the basic purpose is to remind. Uh, remind us of these things that we already have. And precisely that is why, viewers, the Quran, it calls itself to be zikra. Uh, zikra in Arabic means a reminder. So it is a reminder of the facts that we already have. And it starts off with the very first precept which the Almighty has actually commanded us to do, and that is, do not associate anything with him. Yes, this is something that we all know very familiarly. This is called polytheism. The Almighty wants us to be monotheists, to stick to the adherence and worship of one God. Because as far as multiple gods are concerned, the Quran repeatedly tells this to the idolaters of, of uh, Arabia of those times, that when you indulge in idolatry, you do not have any proof of it. Because had there been more than one God, it would have been God himself who ha would have divulged this information. He would have told this information to human beings. And in the absence of any such information, if human beings are making more than one God and associating partners with God, then they are fabricating a lie on God. They are imputing a falsehood on God. And that is why shirk is called iftara Allah, which means imputing a big lie to the Almighty. And that is precisely why viewers the Quran says that the Almighty will not forgive anything uh, done deliberately and if anything that can be forgiven 
that that would be less than polytheism. So anything which is done deliberately, deliberate polytheism is something which will find no forgiveness before the Almighty. And as is the case, you'll find that the very next thing which is mentioned often in the Quran with the right of the Almighty is the right of the parents. And here again, the same is the case. So the very next uh, clause is, and treat your parents with kindness. Again, this is something which is something that we already know. So if you look at the list as we go along, you'll find that all these things are already found in our own intuition, in our own nature. Uh, the concept of a single God is something that is found innately in all of us. The fact that we have to treat our parents with kindness is something that we already know. And the Quran is just trying to remind us that, remember, they are the ones who have brought you into existence. They are the ones who have suffered for you, who have sacrificed so many things for you, who have woken the night so that you can be comfortable in the day, who have maybe indulged in so many sufferings uh, or have underwent so many sufferings so that their own children can live a smooth life. So it is the minimum thing that we can do to our parents is to treat, treat them with kindness. Treat them with respect. Even if we have to differ with them, we have to politely differ with them. So it does not mean that we have to follow whatever they say, especially something that relates to the rights of the children themselves. But then if they have to differ with their parents, it must be with the utmost respect, with utmost regard for them, because they are the ones who think very keenly and very deeply about their children. And yes, it's not always that they are right, because they are human beings and they can be wrong as well. So in such cases, respect has to be at all times dispensed with. The next thing which is mentioned, again, something which is very, very peculiar to the Arab society of those times is the killing of children because of poverty. So, la taqtulu awladakum in imlaq. Kill not your children for fear of poverty. Again, this is something that we know that the Arabs were guilty of, not all uh, Arabs, there were su some sections in the Arab society in which they were particularly very, very harsh on their daughters. They would bury them alive, which is unthinkable, something which sends shudders down our body when we even imagine of such a, such a heinous practice. But yes, this is what they were guilty of. And the reason uh, often and more often than not was because women or children or girls, to be precise, would become a burden to them because they would think that they are not an earning hand, they are not a helping hand. And to them, boys had a very, very uh, special significance. So if, if poverty would be something that was, it would inflict them, then the first thing that they would do was be to cut down their children. And one can not even imagine how they would have the heart to kill an infant and something that is, is unthinkable of. Well, uh, and, and the next thing actually which is mentioned is because people think that uh, children, they are going to curtail one's livelihood or the sustenance that one has got. The Almighty has made this point in a very vehement way. The Quran says, don't think that you sustain them. Don't think that you are providing for them. On the contrary, God says that it is me who not only provides you, so therefore we shall provide them also. So if you're thinking that you're providing for them, you are sadly mistaken. Your own sustenance is something which is provided by God. And if he can provide for you, he can provide for your children as well. So do not indulge in this horrific practice. And do not even go near vulgarities where they are open or, or hidden. So vulgarity, indecency, licentiousness, lewdness, these are all things uh, which make a society, a society, a herd of animals in which there is no distinction between uh, blood relatives and relatives which are not related so closely. The reason for this is that when lusciousness and uh, lustfulness, they, they prevail in a society, they cut at the very roots of the society. And the building block of a society, dear viewers, is the family system. And anything which is a threat to the family system is something which is going to always be a threat to the whole society. So vulgarities, whether they are open, whether they are hidden, they have to be abstained from. We have to be modest. We have to be modest in our gaze. We have to be modest in our behavior. We have to be modest in our clothing. So modesty and chastity is what the Quran teaches us. And this starts off with the eye. If our eyes are, do not take our liberty, if they do not stare at the opposite gender, then, of course, they have that modesty. Remember, an eye is like a window to the heart. 
the, the, the nature of what you view is going to affect your heart as well. And if you have to uh, safeguard your heart from being contaminated, then it is essential that our eyes also remain pure as much as possible. And so therefore, purity is something that starts with the eye. Next thing which is mentioned is And do not kill without any justification, any soul forbidden by God. This of course means that no one has a right to take the life of, an, of a human being, of an individual. The sanctity of human life is such that it can never be in any way tempered with. The Quran says that only on two occasions can death penalty be imposed and that too by state authorities. No single individual, no group has this authority to impose capital punishment. So one of those instances is when someone has murdered someone and the other instance is when someone is guilty of spreading anarchy and disorder in the land. Other than these two instances, the death punishment or the capital punishment is something that can in no way be administered. These are the only two instances. All the rest, all the other instances, they have to be punished in a way that has been either prescribed by the Sharia or lesser forms of punishment be given to them. Human life, needless to say, possesses tremendous sanctity. If a person gets off a human life, then he is basically getting off to the life of the whole society. And that is why the Quran at one occasion has said that if you kill one soul, it is like killing the whole of mankind. And if you are able to save one soul, then you are like saving the whole mankind. Because basically, human life is the guarantee of sustenance and of human beings themselves existing on this earth. And if anything is done to temper with their life, then it is something which is going to cause great disruption in the society. These are the things you to, uh, these are the things God directs you to do so, so that you use your intellect. So remember the Almighty says that these are the things that He has directed you to do, so that you use your intellect and your mind. And this is a very important warning actually from the Quran. It says that whatever the Quran tells you is something which addresses your own intellect. It is something that addresses your own common sense and your insight. It does not address your emotions in this regard. All these facts which have been just narrated before you, these are facts for your own common sense and intellect to understand. And you can very well understand how proscribed and allowed they may be uh, because the uh, reason for that is found in, in our human nature. So if the Almighty has proscribed certain things or prohibited certain things and allowed certain things, as has been mentioned in this list, it is, it is something that clearly is vouched by our own intellect as well. Our intellect endorses all these prohibitions. So the Quran says that these are the things God has commanded you so that you can use your intellect because your own intellect would be something that gives you the same opinion. And do not even go near the wealth of an orphan except in the way that is better for him until he reaches maturity. This has been mentioned a lot of times in the Quran, dear viewers, the rights of the orphans being the one of the weakest sections of the society. They are safeguarded and protected by the Quran at a number of occasions. And here, of course, the import is that if the guardians of the orphans, they have to take care of them. And if at some occasion, some guardian is not that well off and he has to benefit from the wealth of the orphans in order to sustain himself as well, then it should be in a very, very uh, cautious way. He should not overdo it. He should just withdraw that amount, which is just sufficient for his own sustenance and look after the orphans in the best possible way. At another occasion in Surah Nisa, people are said, especially the guardians, that they must return this wealth that has been consigned to them as soon as these orphans, they reach uh, maturity and they must not consume their wealth that these orphans might reach maturity soon enough and they would have nothing to benefit from. So, being the weakest section of the society, remember, orphans are something, orphans are individuals which are mentioned in the Quran at a number of occasions. And weigh with honesty and for the measure. Again, this is something which the Quran has stressed repeatedly. As traders, uh, which the Arabs were, we all know that they were given this very special directive that when you are dealing with people, you are measuring for them or weighing for them, or you are dispensing their goods and merchandise, then it should be equal in measure. Not the slightest difference in this should be made in any, any way. لا نكلف نفسا إلا بسعها. And we do not burden a soul with more than it can bear. Again, this is something which the Quran has said 
that it does not give a directive which is beyond human capacity. So therefore, people must realize that the Sharia that they are given is a gift from the Almighty. It is a boon that they are enjoying and not a bane at all. And when you speak, speak the truth, even if the matter is about your relatives. Again, a very sensitive issue. The Quran says that if you have to please your relatives and at the same time you have to speak the truth as well, the two cannot go together if the two are taken apart in the way that they are not mutually inclusive all the time. At times you have to speak the truth and let your relatives become angry with you. Our own mandate in this regard is that truth has to prevail at all costs and we should not care whether anyone gets angry or annoyed because it is the right of the truth that we always follow it, abide by it and administer it. And fulfill God's promise. God's promise, of course, is it relates to all promises made with God, whether they are written or unwritten. Unwritten promises include, uh, of course, our own obedience to his religion and at the same time, our own uh, allegiance to what he has sent down. And at the same time, the law of the land, which the Almighty has always asked us to follow, including this, the constitution of the country that we are living in, the laws of the country that we are living in, we must abide by them at all costs. And finally, these are the things God directs you to so that you receive a reminder. Once again, this passage finishes off with this very famous note and something that you'll find very familiarly mentioned in the Quran, that if the Quran tells you something, remember this is something that is just to remind you. These are the things that you already know in your heart. These are nothing new to us. These are precepts of our own intuition, of our own understanding, of our own intellect. So therefore, if the Quran is speaking of them, it is not bringing us to a new list of things to be obeyed. It is just reminding that we already know. And for this, we come to an end to today's session. And now we shall move on to our next segment of Q&A. Thank you, Dr. Shazad, for a detailed, guided explanation of the verses. Our first question comes from Samra Harun. Uh, please unmute your mic and ask your question. Ji. <coughs> Assalamu alaikum, sir. Alaykum, sir, salam. my question is, کہ صحیح بخاری میں ایک حدیث ہے کہ جبرائیل علیہ السلام نے آپ صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم کو قرآن پاک سات طریقوں سے سکھایا تھا سیون موڈ سے تو سر اس کا کیا مطلب ہے مطلب سیون ڈفرینٹ پروناسیشن تھیں سیون ڈفرینٹ ڈائلیکٹ مطلب یہ کچھ کیسے سمجھے اس روایت پر بہت تفصیلی کام ہوا ہوا ہے میں نے بھی کیا ہوا اس پہ لیکچر بھی دیے ہوئے آپ اس کو دیکھ سکیں روایت کوئی بہت ثابت شدہ روایت نہیں ہے اس روایت پر بہت سارے سوالات اٹھتے ہیں بہت سارے اعتراضات ہیں اس پہ آپ اس کو دیکھ لیجئے متعلقہ جگہوں پہ اگر آپ کو تشفی نہ ہو تو پھر آپ دوبارہ پوچھ لیجئے گا بہت تفصیل سے اس پہ بات کی ہوئی ہے سر کہاں پہ اگر آپ ریفرنس بتا سکتے آپ جو تاریخ القرآن پہ میرے لیکچرز ہیں اس میں آپ دیکھ سکتی ہیں میں نے اس پہ لکھا ہوا بھی ہے اپنی کتاب تاریخ القرآن میں اور اگر آپ تاریخ القرآن کے جو موضوعات پہ جو میں نے لیکچرز دی ہیں اس میں سبت و احرف اس کا نام ہی عربی میں اس کو کہتے ہیں سات احرف یا سبت و احرف اگر آپ وہ سات احرف کی حدیث کو تلاش کریں گی تو اس میں آپ کو بہت تفصیلی جواب مل جائے گا ٹھیک ہے لائک ڈیزیز ان فیملی اور فائنینشیل کرائسس اور آن لارجر اسکیل ایز وی آر واچنگ دا پیلسٹائن پیپل دے آر گوئنگ تھرو از اٹ ڈیٹ بٹ وی وین وی ہیو نو سولوشن دین وی ہیو نتھنگ بٹ ٹو ہیو توکل آن اللہ اور سم ٹائم وی ہیو فیتھ ان اللہ اینڈ ایٹ دا سیم ٹائم وی کیپ آن اسٹرگلنگ آن آر اون وی ٹرائی to look for solutions and uh, uh, try to sort out the situations. So mm -hmm. does, does it show uh, lack of tawakkal or uh, lack of iman? Please explain. So, actually, you see, you need to differentiate uh, and make the distinction. There are, there are certain individual situations that we face and for, for which we are accountable and for which we can do something. And then there are certain other collective situations uh, which, of course, they do disturb us, but uh, sitting far off or maybe in a situation that we are in, We cannot have any role except that we are conceptually clear about what is happening and how the Almighty deals with his people uh, regarding these uh, collective matters. So as far as our individual matters are concerned, for example, if you deal with someone's death or someone's illness or maybe financial constraint, 
these are the things that we have to understand by actually comprehending the law of trial of the Almighty, which is uh, which He has uh, made, uh, he, which, on which He has made this universe and this world. He has said that people have been created in this world so that they can be tried and tested. And this trial can only be conducted if they are made to pass through tough circumstances. And at times they are made to pass through good circumstances also. So, uh, what we have to understand is that whatever we are going through at this instance uh, as a personal loss in life or maybe some sickness, it is a form of trial from the Almighty which is meant for our own betterment. So, I have been explaining this uh, on a number of occasions that these trials are meant for our own betterment. So, at times, you see, these trials become instrumental in bringing us closer to God. Uh, they make us realize that we might be doing something wrong in our life and we need to reevaluate our lives. So, they are like, uh, they awaken us from our slumber. At times, we don't realize that we might be doing something wrong. And such trials, they caution us and they prod us. Similarly, another uh, outcome of a, good, of a trial is that we become stronger than before and we are able to face greater trials in life. We draw on our reserves when we are passing through these uh, testing times and we become stronger than before. So, at times, God wants you to equip you with this strength so that you can face a further tougher trial. And sometimes God also shields you from some greater calamity. So, these are all the experiences and the hikmah or the reasons at, for which the Almighty uh, actually is uh, making us pass through various trials. So, if we are able to understand this philosophy of trials, we will have that greater trust in God because we would then believe that whatever is happening is happening for some good. And uh, I might not be understanding at the moment, but whatever is happening is happening according to the scheme of God. And that scheme is something that has to uh, implement itself. At the same time, we must also look at the past and see how we have been passing through good times also. So, at times, we lose sight of God's blessings because we don't, because we think that we have been in this condition or in this situation all the time. Whereas definitely, if you look back in the past, you'll find that, yes, there were so many good moments in life also. There were so many uh, comfortable uh, life moments that we remember. But because we are passing through straightened circumstances, we think that we are always in these circumstances. So, looking back also gives us this, uh, this assurance that life was not always that bad. Now, as far as... Uh, Collective circumstances are concerned, like for example, you pointed out to the Palestine conflict. Then again, we have to see that these are instances that are rooted in history, they are rooted in politics, they have a very, very deeply rooted functioning. They're not as simple as what we can see at the moment. Uh, if you look at the Palestine conflict, I have spoken about it a number of times in this session also. I have given a special lecture on this occasion, also on this matter as well. And I've tried to explain that it, this goes back to two and a half thousand years uh, ago when the Jews were persecuted. Uh, or, according to the Quran, they were punished for their denial of Jesus and then uh, they had to pass through various testing and trying circumstances. And now, today, they have this belief that they are going to build the third temple and unless the third temple is built, the Messiah is not going to come and they are waiting for that Messiah. So, for, for this, they are hell-bent to create that temple. And if given a chance, they'll do that. And the Hamas gave them this chance by actually taking the initiative and it uh, bombarded them and gave that chance that they were waiting for. So, now they are uh, capitalizing on their chance. They are, of course, uh, they have unleashed a barbarity that cannot be explained. But then we have to remember that this is something what uh, the Hamas, if it is true, uh, it, uh, I mean, they were responsible of. And even if it is not true, then we have to realize that uh, when Israel had come into being uh, many years ago in 1948, there was another solution which was presented by the United Nations in which the United, in, in which there were three state, uh, three state solution that was presented and perhaps which was the best solution to this whole conflict. But the Muslims did not, I mean, did not like it. The solution that the United Nations gave in 1948 was that they will declare a state of Palestine and they will declare a state of Israel. And the third state or would be a city of Jerusalem, which would be given in the custody of the international community. And all the three religions would be allowed to go and practice there. This was back in 1948. But this was not, uh, I mean, ex ex acceptable. And then we had so many wars and we know that uh, over a period of 50 or 60 years, uh, it, uh, it, uh, I mean, the various amounts of struggle that were launched within Palestine, uh, none of them, I mean, uh, only now you find the PLO, for example, uh, going for a very peaceful uh, solution. Other than that, the PLO, which was the Palestine Liberation Organization, and uh, of course, the uh, the currently the Hamas, they are all militant organizations. So basically, these are militants who have seized power and they think the solution of this conflict is through militant means. 
And if you start killing people and especially innocent civilians, then whether the Israelites do it or the Palestinians do it, it is equally wrong. You just cannot uh, bombard civilians. But both sides have been guilty of this. So if you have to view this whole situation, then you must have this background in mind. And you must also see that just as there are fanatics amongst Muslims who kill children, who kill innocent uh, people by suicide bombings, so you have fanatics in other in other religions also and they are also they also have their agenda and they are also driven by their own religion so basically this is how you have to understand that this is not a simple uh, bombardment of a few in, uh, individuals and resulting in so many uh, uh, I mean colossal uh, death of about 30000 people it has a very very deeply rooted uh, background and if you are able to gauge that background then perhaps you'll understand that what is going on thank you dr shahzad for a detailed answer of the question there's another question in the chat when it is said in the Quran, what is to come will be better for you than what has gone by and similar verses. Uh, are they referring to things that will be provided in this world or the reward of the hereafter? Well, if you look at the context, in most cases, this is referring to the Prophet's own personality and the struggle that he was passing through. So remember, in the Meccan period, the uh, Muslims were, were, were badly outnumbered. They were persecuted. They were subjected to various forms, forms of torture. So on most occasions when this verse has come, it is in this context that the future is going to be better for you. It's not that it is addressing all of us, it's addressing the Prophet actually and his companions that if you are passing through these testing times, then remember the promise of God is that initially you might be put to test, but ultimately victory is going to be yours. And there's another question, our, what should be our role in the Palestinian issue? Uh, wait and I just see. answered oh. it. I mean, the role is that first of all, we must be conceptually clear what's going on. It's not just a simple battle. It has a very deeply rooted religious uh, background. And of course, there are now political players also. The Jewish lobby is very strong. The US lobby is governed by the Jewish lobby. And uh, if they are doing something that we are not able to understand, then we have to uh, make this mental note that they are now, they are now very, very hell bent to create that third temple, which of course is something uh, which according to them, will only guarantee the arrival of the Messiah. So, I mean, it's like a holy target that they have in life. And when they kill children, uh, the way they justify themselves is that, well, for a greater good, this is just collateral damage. This is much like how, as I said, uh, when the Taliban kill innocent children or people that they don't target, and they, they, was, they would target a few individuals, but as collateral damage, sometimes other people would also die. And the justification when they would be asked would be that they would say that, well, well, if innocent people are dying, don't worry, they are going to heaven. So you see, just as this lopsided logic has its play uh, in amongst the Taliban, so they do also have the same logic. And when they think that the children are being, uh, I mean, ruthlessly being killed, uh, another logic that they presented, as you would be knowing if you follow uh, the news there, and uh, I'm not sure if it is true or not, but this is what they have officially said also, and that is, that uh, the, the, the hospital that they have bombed, they say that the control center of the, uh, of the uh, Hamas uh, has, is under those uh, hospitals underground. So they are using these hospitals as human shields. And they say that if they are, they are bombing these hospitals, it is not, uh, I mean, they, are, they would not like to bomb these hosp hospitals. It is only because these, the Hamas offices and the control room is hiding beneath underground these hospitals that they have to undertake this. So this is the justification they have given. Whether it's true or not is another thing. But you see, you have to understand empathetically what is going wrong with them. Yes, thank you so much. Salman Aziz, you may ask your question now. Sir, Javed Mughami sir, there was a video that I had said that we had to read the Quran as a whole. And he had to read the points of view. لیکن بعد میں پھر ان کی ایک اور ویڈیو آئی جس میں ان سے پوچھا گیا کہ کہتا ہے ہم کبھی بھی قرآن کا ترجمہ جو ہے بغیر کسی استاد کے پڑھنے کو ریکمنٹ نہیں کرتے ہیں میں کہیں اس میں تھوڑا سا اگر مجھے یہ تو آپ ان سے ہی پوچھ سکتے ہیں لیکن جتنا میں ان کو جانتا ہوں ہو سکتا ہے جو دوسری بات ہے وہ اس میں کوئی تفصیل ہو جو آپ کے سامنے نہ آئی ہو ورنہ بالموم جو وہ بات کہتے ہیں وہ وہی ہے کہ آپ کو سادہ ترجمہ پڑھنا چاہیے اور بجائے سے کہ آپ تفسیر پڑھیں آپ قرآن کے ترجمے پر اپنے اپنے آپ کو فوکس رکھیں جہاں سوال پیدا ہو آپ تفسیر وہاں دیکھیں تفسیر تو انسان کی بنائی ہوئی تشریح ہے تو اللہ تعالیٰ کا کلام تو ترجمے سے واضح ہوتا ہے تو اکثر اوقات تو وہ واضح ہو جاتا ہے اللہ تعالیٰ کیا کہہ رہے ہیں تو وہ جو جب وہ بات کہتے ہیں وہ یہ ہے کہ لوگوں کو عام طور سے یہ ایک جذبہ پیدا ہوتا ہے کہ ہم دورے تفسیر کریں یا تفسیر پڑھیں تو اس پر وہ بتاتے ہیں کہ دیکھیے تفسیر ایسی ہے جیسے لغت ہے جیسے ڈکشنری ہے تو ڈکشنری کو تو آپ پڑھتے نہیں آپ کنسلٹ کرتے ہیں جب ضرورت پیش آتی ہے تو اسی طرح تفسیر کو کنسلٹ کیا جاتا ہے یا استاد کو کنسلٹ کیا جاتا ہے جب ضرورت پیش آئے 
ورنہ اللہ تعالیٰ نے اگر یہی کام کرنا ہوتا تو استاد نازل کرتے ساتھ اور ہر ایک کہتے جی کہ آپ بغیر استاد کے نہیں پڑھ سکتے قرآن تو ایسا نہیں کہتا قرآن تو اپنے بارے میں یہ کہتا ہے کہ حد الناس وہ لوگوں کے لیے ہدایت ہے تو میرے خیال ہے اگر آپ ان کی بات کو پورا سمجھیں یا سارے مواقع پر جو انہوں نے گفتگو کی ہے اگر آپ دیکھیں گے تو شاید وہ یہی کہہ رہے ہیں Thank you, Dr. Shahzad. There's a question in the chat. What is the significance of saying Aital Kursi after every first prayer? After every first prayer, I don't find any significance. It's just something that we do culturally or maybe your elderly people or your parents have told you. Otherwise, there's no such recommendation from the Prophet or from the Quran. Sure. Thank you. Um, there's a question. There's another question in the chat that, uh, uh, as you said earlier, that it's okay to say uh, in English, Uh, in namaz only five things must be said in arabic and the rest can be prayed in english so mm-hmm. i don't uh, she wants to know that where uh, did you learn in this farahib school of thought about namaz because she really likes it and it does help to strengthen god's connection but she likes she would like to learn the background of this uh, because you see if you look at the history of the prayer you'll find out that these are the five occasions which are said loud in a congregational prayer And regarding all the other occasions, if you look at the Hadith literature, you'll find that the Prophet is giving you this option by instructing you and telling you, well, if you want, you can say this. So he is always qualifying his statement by saying, if you want, you can say this. If you want, you can say this. Otherwise, you can say anything that you comes to your own mind. So these are the five occasions in which he was very stringent. He was very strict. And he said that these are the five occasions that, has, that have to be said loudly uh, in the congregational prayer and they have to be said in Arabic. So if you look at individual narratives, for example, uh, I'll give you one example regarding the last rakat in which you sit for At-Tahiyat. So you'll, you'll find the entire conversation of the At-Tahiyat uh, that we, I mean, the, the, the words that we use, uh, it occurs in the conversation between the Prophet and one of his companions in, his, in which he was reciting certain words. And the Prophet corrected him and he said, well, if you are going to say something, if you have to make dua and uh, supplicate before the Almighty, this is one thing that is recommended. So the nature of that uh, teaching itself tells us that he is instructing us that, well, if you would like, you can say this. Otherwise, you can say other things as well. Sure. Thank you. There's one very short question, which is when walking and praying namaz, do we have to bow down when it's when it uh, and just recite the words or we just like make? Of course not. I mean, when you are walking, you're just going to make gestures which are, I mean, appropriate for your walking so that uh, you don't collide with some something. Uh, you know, when you're walking, the prayer would be uh, accustomed. I mean, it would be geared towards how you walk and justice would be as minimum as possible. And your own heart will tell you and your own mind will tell you what to do. Of course, you cannot prostrate. Of course, you cannot kneel even. So it will be merely by gestures that you will be uh, uh, doing all those things. Thank you. Uh, last question, Baran, you may ask your question now. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa <clears throat> Sir, my question is about uh, in one of these ayats, God tells us that he will provide for the children that we get. And I re- re- remember there was another ayat where Allah said, get the unmarried married. And if they do not have enough money, I will provide for them. So right. does this mean that if we are pursuing certain uh, goals in life, such as marriage or children, that we do not have the financial uh, stability yet? we can go forth and trust that Allah will open doors for us to sustain us? Precisely. Yes, that is what is mentioned. That if you are not in a position and you're financially weak, then this, this don't make this uh, pretext for not marrying if you have all other things in place. And trust God and He will provide you with that sustenance. Uh, thank you everyone for participating and joining. Thank you Dr. Shahzad for this session. Uh, we will conclude our session over here today and see you all tomorrow, inshallah. Allah Hafiz. Allah.